I know I just sang, but we're going to sing half of a stanza of a song. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. This is why we're here today. We're here for what God has done in our past through Christ as well as, as and again, I, I, it's a scary thing, but as, as uh, seeing the things in the news, anytime Israel's in the news and there's stuff going, I'm going, you know, I'll share them with a, a Sunday school class uh, um, earlier going, all right, it's the second coming. You know, he's coming. He could be. He could be any time now. I just where that's where I go. And and there, you know, I got a few strange looks and going. You know, I was like, well, listen. You know, it says when you see these things, rejoice, for your redemption draws near. You know, and so again, now we don't know that. Again, there have been plenty of skirmishes and battles and wars before. But again, it always when it's around Israel, I start going, all right. Let's listen for the trumpet. Anyway, so, um, but, but, oh God, our help in ages past. See, it, homecoming is a time to remember. Now, I don't mean to get, you know, all, you know, sappy and all that other stuff and remember who and when and all that, but, but, but there is a time for that. There is a time to remember what God has done in ages past to reflect on his faithfulness. And so, so you know, we, we want to do that. And, and again, that's what a lot of times what we do. Um, I want to focus more today, though, on looking ahead. To look ahead what God will do. Now, not going to the specifics, so there's some things that God has been working on my heart as well as some of the others that, that you know, and I, it's not the time to share that yet. So, so but, uh, but he is our hope for years to come. That song came to my mind regarding homecoming and then, then um, uh, this passage of scripture that, that I'm getting ready to read came to mind because, you know, to move ahead, to move what God wants us as a church as well as believers in, gen in general to do, because I know that there's some that are here and they, they're, they, you normally attend another church right now. You know, th this is for all of us. What will help us move ahead in days when biblical truths are scorned? What will help us move ahead in days when church attendance is dropping? What will help us move ahead in days when churches care more what the world thinks and catering to it? What will help us move ahead when it's in days when right is wrong and wrong is right? What helps us in the dark days to see the light? What helps us when we're in the throes of grief? What will help us when we're in a time of going, I don't know what to do? That's what Paul addresses to the church in this passage of Scripture found in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just read that again. You may not have the ESV. You can have a, another translation and look at it. Uh, for the rest of the message, it'll pop up. But let me just read it. Sometimes there's something about just listening to the Word. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? 
And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. And Jesus, what you give, what Paul was asking for the church is what you want to give, especially in times where it seems dark and especially in times when we're like, you know, what's going on? What do I need to decide? How do I make it through? And so God, you have been our help in ages past. You are our hope for years to come. Lead us now as we look in your word. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. For those who like to do the half sheets and all that, let me just let you know there's going to be a period of time that my intro, whatever, you know, so, so don't be going, what is, what is, what is, sometimes you, you miss all the other stuff. Uh, you'll, you'll see it because the first, first line of it is, I'll let you know. First of all, we're looking at the need of the church. What is, what is the need that, that Paul is, is addressing because he begins this passage by saying a couple things the church already has, you know, and so, so, you know, here it is. They already have faith in Christ. As the passage says, for this reason, okay, because this is already true, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, okay? So check that off. They have faith. Now he's writing to the church. He's, and again, you know, that's one of the things. Listen, if this isn't true for you, this needs to come true before any of this other part comes to okay? But, but he's talking to the church and saying, okay, one, you're, you're believers, you put faith in Jesus, okay? So they already have that. Well, then he continues. They already have love for each other. Listen, they've already gone where half churches haven't gone, you know? They, they already have love for each other. And I tell you what, it, it, it did my heart really good this morning. And, and you even made tears come out of my eyes. Unfortunately, I had about a minute before the service started. When, when I, I got to wheel Barry in here and y'all just applauded, you know, and why? Because you missed him and you love him. And, and that's what it should look like. Um, and so, so they already have love. Look, 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 he teaches. He says, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. So, get, you know, it's like, boom, all right, they've got, they've got this and that. Now, let me share another passage of scripture that Paul wrote earlier to the, the church of Gal Galatia. And, and you'll see the significance of this. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Well, they got faith. And they got love. Who could ask for anything more? I mean, they've got it. They've got what he's, Paul's saying, this is what really matters. It's like, so, so Paul, Paul, why is it that, that the next thing that you say is, I don't cease to give thanks for you, but remembering you in my prayers because there's more that you need. There's more than you need than just faith and love for one another, even though that's a wonderful thing. So what is it that he's going to be praying? Because they had faith. They had love. What else do they need? Well, that's when he starts going to his prayers. Because you have this, we're going to the next thing. Now, I'll give you a hint. Well, well it says, he says, I, I pray that you may know something. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not looking at my notes. Um, he prays that we would know something. And in his prayer, he's saying that something is beyond our ability to know on our own. Look at his language. That the God of our Lord Jesus, so this is his prayer, I'm praying that, okay. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, and he's like, so here's, here it is, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, 
that you may know. Now listen, listen. Paul liked to write long sentences. <laughs> and sometimes in those long sentences, you kind of go, what in the world is he asking for? Basically, see, I, I, yeah, I'm praying that the God of our Father, uh, uh, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may, will help you know. But he's got all these other words in there. And he's saying, because listen, listen, without his help, without him giving you the spirit of wisdom, without him giving you the, the revelation in the knowledge of him, without opening your eyes so that your hearts can be enlightened, you're not going to get this. Now, who's he talking to? He's not talking to lost people who need to know the Lord and, and without God's revealing, they wouldn't know the Lord. Now, that's true, but that's, he's talking to the church. Church, you've got to get this. You've got love. You've got faith. But there's something else. There's something else. What are we supposed to know? What is it that we need help in knowing? In Corinthians 13, 13 says this, after going through this long list of what love is, he says, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three. You see the one missing? They had faith. They had love. Well, what didn't they have? Hope. Hope. And he goes, and the greatest of these is love because, yeah. Now he goes on to know the hope. To know the hope. That you, after all this, you know, all the stuff that leads to it, I, I pray that God will help you know what is the hope to which he has called you. And so we're just getting to, okay, so he's praying that we have hope. We're praying that we know the hope that God has granted us and he gives us once we have, have answered his call for salvation. Because guess what? Many Christians don't get it. And they don't get the hope. You ever known a Christian to be hopeless? Have you as a Christian ever been felt hopeless? And so hopefully this will be answering these things. To know the hope. Let me define hope. Because the English language, there's not a good word to translate from the original Greek. Because what does our word hope mean in general? The English word hope can mean, now here's your first blank for those who like to do blanks. You got away from the half sheet because I've been going on for 10 minutes. Okay, so is, he ever, is this message ever going to end? He hasn't even given a blank. So here it is. The English word hope can mean uncertainty. Okay, well, use that in a sentence. I don't know, but I hope so. Okay, you read that. Again, it's a common phrase. You know, is that going to happen? I don't know, but I hope so. And so, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know. It, it, it might, it might not. It, that's the English word for hope. And there's not an English word that, that, that well, there is an English word, but, but uh, the, the Bible word means certainty. <laughs> not a, not I hope so. But I know so. Because a hope can go. Now listen, listen. There's a lot of things in our life we hope on. Some hope on how much money you have in, in your 401k, whatever, your, your retirement fund. Or, or, or some people hope in, in, in your health. And some people can uh, hope in, in all sorts of different things. But listen, if our hope is on something that can be taken away, it's just that English word, I hope. When God says, no, I, I don't want you to hope. I want you to know these things. 
That's, that's the definition of hope. The necessity of hope. The necessity of hope is this. Hope is the certainties of tomorrow that keep us going today. Now, again, I just mentioned a bunch of things. You might think, well, you know, I've got so much money in the bank and all that. Well, let me, let me get to meet you. In. Anyway, or I've got so much, you know, that, that I've got all these friends and I've got this family. I've got this. Listen, listen. Any of these things can be taken away. What is the hope that nothing can take away? Because guess what? Our health goes bad. Our, our, our finances go away. Accidents happen. All these different things. What is the hope? What is the certainty of tomorrow that will help you live in the trials and darkness today? There's a song in our handbook. Don't turn it because I just put the words there. It, it, we, we, I don't know if we've ever sung this song. It's a wonderful song. I, I tried to pick up the tune of it, and it's just like, for all the saints. But I got, that's as far as I got. But, but anyway, this is like the fourth verse of five. But it so pictures what hope can do. It says, and when the strife is fierce, the warfare long... Steals on the ear the distant triumph song, and hearts are brave again, and arms are strong. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know what you're thinking. At the same time, when I first read this, is just going, okay. <laughs> let, let me tell you what that means. They've been fighting so long. They're tired. They're weary. They don't know. Am I going to make it through the night? Am I going to, are we going to win as an army? Are we going to be defeated? And they're tired and weary and they can't lift another finger. And then steals on the ear, they hear a trumpet. A trumpet from another army that's coming to reinforce them. They hear the distant triumph song. Now physically, what has happened to them? Nothing. They're still tired. They're still warm. But because of hope, that army is on the way. Our, 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 the rescue is here. We're going to win. We're going to make it. Hearts are brave again. Arms are strong again. And we're able to continue the battle. This is what hope can do. Because hope is knowing. I just pulled three things out of, out of Romans 8. Hope is knowing that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. If you were at Steve's funeral last week, that passage was used. Hope is knowing that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, that, that God is still in control. Hope is knowing that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are our hopes. These are certainties that can help us in life. To know as a believer in Christ who has lost a fellow believer in Christ to death. To know we will see each other again. The substance of hope. This is not the only thing he prayed for us to know, but they're connected. The hope that he says, I want you to know, the hope that came with the calling that he had on your life brings other things that are connected with this hope. The substance is one, knowing the future inheritance. Knowing the future inheritance. It says, he says that, that, that you can, you know, know the hope of his calling 
And what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Again, he uses so many words in such a small little thing. I just wanted to break it down, okay? Knowing the future inheritance, riches, <laughs> great value. Uh, something that, wow, I mean, you know, when you say somebody's rich, wow, you must have a lot if you're rich. Okay, again, just using these words, something of great value. Then it says glorious. You know, and I, you know, you can go all biblical and all that, but you know what the word glory, when you see glory, what do you say? Wow. Words cannot fill in the blank. Wow, that, that is your blank, by the way. Uh, wow, you know, it is, it is, it is, not as the riches of his glorious inheritance. It, it's something we don't have now, but we're going to get it later. And when we get it, it will be worth it all. It'll be worth the wait. It will be worth the suffering. It will be worth all of that. It will be worth the wait. Now think about it. Think about it. You know, if somebody says, well, that's my inheritance. You know, I am talking about earthly inheritance. It's something like, hey, you know, you know, somebody, you know, died or someone gave something to you or whatever. And it's like, it's the big portion of your life. It's the thing that you look to. It's the thing that now helped you make it through the day over and over and over again. That inheritance. Now, what is this, this inheritance? Because when I, when I first read this passage, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? You know what I thought of regarding the inheritance? What am I going to get? What am I going to get? Because when you talk about inheritance, well, what am I going to get? That's not this passage. There's some other passage that talks about our inheritance. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says this, but as it's written, what I, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now that's talking about the inheritance and he's basically saying, you never seen it, you never heard it, you can't even think it. It's going to be so wonderful. But again, that's not what this passage is talking about. In fact, um, Paul had already talked about the inheritance we will receive in just a few verses earlier than this, this passage. In verse 11, he said, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Okay, so we are going to get an inheritance. And then it says later, though, that when the promised Holy Spirit comes, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So, so until we get the inheritance, we have the Holy Spirit. And so, so it's like, so, so he's already talked about the inheritance where getting. That's not what this passage is talking about. Well, what is this passage? I'm hoping you're asking these questions. What is it talking? What do you mean? It says inheritance and all this other stuff. Knowing the future inheritance. Here's the question I have. Whose inheritance? Who is getting the inheritance in this passage? Let me give you some of the words of the verse of his glorious inheritance. Who is getting the inheritance? Who is his glorious? God. I, you know, Jesus, God. Yeah, okay, all right. God's getting an inheritance? I thought he already owned it all. I mean, really, what can you, I mean, okay, you know, we were talking earlier about inheritance. It's just something, somebody, oh, wow, you know, there's going to be a lot. It's going to be, oh, this is my inheritance. This is the most valuable thing in my life. This is wonderful. What does God say his inheritance is? What is the inheritance? Well, let me fill in a little bit more of that, what that verse says. Of his glorious inheritance in the saints. What is God's inheritance? What is his riches? What is his wow? Dana's doing this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. 
That's not just words for the special believers. That's for all believers. We are. We are God's inheritance. <laughs> the saints, believers in Christ, we're the great value. We're the wow. We are worth the wait. Now listen, listen. This, I believe, is why Paul says, you're not going to get this unless it's revealed to you. You're not going to get this unless the Holy Spirit gives you that, that, that revelation of the knowledge of him. You're not going to get this. To, but just to realize that when God looks at you, believer, he's going, you're my riches. Me? Me? You're my wow. You're what I'm waiting for. Now listen, listen. It's one thing for someone to say, you know, you know that you're, you're of great value and stuff like that. But the one who knows all and has all to say, you are. Listen, I, I believe it will take the Holy Spirit the rest of my life to fully swallow this truth. But you think about no matter what in life to realize that the God of all creation looks at you and says, wow, I can't wait to spend eternity with you. That is the riches his, his, of his inheritance in the saints. So the substance of our hope is this, the inheritance that, that we are, that, that, that this is something that God is looking forward to, but also knowing the present power. Because, okay, that's nice. One day in heaven, and, and this, I'm going to be inheritance as I get an inheritance, and, and that's, that's, everybody's going to be happy. And stuff. But what about today? And I also want you to know what is the measurable, immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. Now, again... I want, you know, again, the, the, the sentence is basically that you would know the power that he has for us, okay? But he adds all these words. I, I, I highlighted a couple of the words. There's different words in that language that, that talk about power, 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 and, and, and these are different words, and I'm not going to go into all the Greek and stuff like that, but it's just like basically Paul uses every word he could for power, and he throws it into this verse. <laughs> the greatness of his power toward us, I believe, according to his working of his great might. How great is this power? Well, he says, it raised Jesus from the dead. That's great power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Let me ask you, how low can you go? I would say death is it. And he raised him from the lowest of the lowest because he took our sin and paid our debt. How great is his power? Conquering the greatest enemy, death. How great is his power? It raised Jesus from the dead. It placed Jesus on the throne. And it seated him, raised from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Okay? How high can you go? I already asked the question. How low can you go? How, death. How high can you get? There's nothing higher than the throne of God. So he raised him. The power of God raised him from the lowest of the low to the highest of the heights. And he even says so, he, he goes on above everything, forever. 
<laughs> For are above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that's named, not only in this age, but the one to come. And you just, you can, we can dwell a lot on that, but just think about it. No, no matter who you've thought who's been a ruler or authority, the, the good ones and the bad ones, the super powerful ones and all that, it's just like, he's far above that. Far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, above every name. You think about all the famous people in the world and all this other stuff, you know, that you could ask, hey, who's your favorite person? Or who's the most famous who did this? Or, and you can come up with a lot of names. And he's like, where's Jesus' name above that? It's not even on the list. It's above the list. And this will be forever and ever. Now, when it comes to hope, our hope is based not on an event. I mean, now we've talked about, okay, this inheritance and, you know, one day when I die, I'm going to be with him forever and all that. But today there's a, you know, but listen, it's not based on an event. It's based on a person. And who is that person? Christ. Our hope is based on him. What does Christ do as, as being the one who's now been raised from the dead, who is above all authority and all rule and all dominion? What does he do that he is above every name and all that? What does he do with all that power and authority? It says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God gave him. I place you above all things. You are above all powers. You are above all dominion. I place you above all of these things for the church, for people who believe on you, for us. I said this at the beginning of, near the beginning of the message. Hope is the certainties of tomorrow that keep us going today. I don't know what your today is like. But I want to talk about a day that somebody had that was worse than any of ours could ever be. And it was the day that Jesus was on the cross. Because when Jesus died on the cross, it was the most painful. It was the most humiliating. His friends forsook him. But the worst of all things is God the Father abandoned him. Turned his back. Jesus said, quoting Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You want to talk about a bad day? So I ask this question. What was Jesus' hope on the cross? What got Jesus through? What was the hope of the certainty of tomorrow that helped him in that day? Well, it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the joy? We are. What kept him on the cross, what helped him through that day, what helped him through the anguish that I deserved, that we deserved? What helped him to go through that knowing that we one day would be his inheritance? You want to talk one who loves us so? You want to talk about a truth that will help you endure the thing to realize that the hope that brought Jesus through was the certainty of knowing those who would put their faith on him. So here's my question. Have you put your faith on him? Have you trusted him? As your Lord and Savior. I did not say who prayed a little prayer 
uh, or, or who walked the aisle or who got baptized because, get, listen, you, you can go through motions. If you know Christ as Savior, your life is changed. If your life has not changed, then you don't know my Jesus. And that's not a pride thing. It's just how could the God of all, all the universe dwell inside of us and it not make a lick of difference? Because he becomes our hope. So I ask. This, this passage has been directed to believers. Believers, we have the hope that will bring us through today. That hope is, is knowing that we're in his, his inheritance. He's the one waiting for us. He's the one, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. It's kind of like waiting for Christmas. I can't wait, I can't wait to open this. You know, he's the one who's going to give us the strength to endure. But you have to know him as Lord and Savior. Do you? I well, like every head bow and eyes closed. I am not one to use emotion, pressure, because I believe if the Holy Spirit's convicting, he convicts. When I was saved, I didn't come down during an invitation. There wasn't one. But guess what? I came down. I came down after, and I spoke with the pastor. That's kind of how I've been doing things lately. Because this is between you and God. And so when, when everybody's going off to, to form the line to get all that wonderful food, listen, if the Holy Spirit is convicting you, you're not even hungry. You have a realization that, that you have sin just like I do, and all, but, but that your sin is not taken care of. You've not received the one who took care of it for you. And so following the service, following the closing song that we have, um, I'm going to hang out in the front. And if you are realizing, I need Christ, please come to me and we'll talk. I'd love to share how you can know Jesus as Savior. And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you for the hope. And God, I pray first we have faith. And then we love one another. But then, Father, <laughs> to be rooted in the hope of our calling. Oh, God. Our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. I thank you that in ages past, you already saw us. And Jesus, you died for us. You now are our hope. You are what we stand firm on. You and you alone. <coughs> I pray in your name. Amen.